All right, so next Sunday, you're going to bring a breakfast finger food to share. You're, we're going to start at 1030, be here by 1030. Two gifts for our stockings. All right, we're going to wish Miss Lauren a happy birthday tomorrow. All right, children, you are dismissed. Praise the Lord. Y'all need to be careful because uh, we might end up just in heaven, just like we'll just cross over. Amen. You know, when you, when you are uh, using everything that you've got to praise the Lord and to say something like, all hail King Jesus, all hail the Savior. You know, when the wise men went before Jesus and they, the shepherds and they were all standing around and, and worshiping him. How crazy that must have seemed to Mary and to Joseph that these people we don't even know have come to lift him up, to, to giving us gifts. And I mean, they had a hard time finding a place to have the baby. And then they've got people coming in from all over that are coming to worship him. And, you know, um, that's something special that we share and that we have on the inside of us is that people, when we come around, people are like, wow, we're going to talk about that this morning. Be like, wow, I'm so glad you were here today. I'm so glad that you, that you stepped in, that you stepped in and, and you spoke, spoke to me today. Amen. Uh, we're going to talk about love at Christmas this morning. Um, you know, Christmas is, is such a fun time of year. Uh, you know, it's such a such an exciting time, especially when you're a kid that you get to, uh, you know, you look forward to Santa Claus and you look forward to seeing, I can't remember being a kid and uh, I was in one of those families that we went to, and I'm, I'm sure most of you are the same, but you went to like your one grandparent, one, you know, the night before Christmas, then you went to the, the other grandparent the, the next day and you kind of swapped back and forth on who got who got you on Christmas Day, you know? And it was like, to me, it was a big deal which grandparent got me on Christmas Day because, I mean, that was Christmas Day. And, uh, you know, and, and you, you think about it like that as a kid and you're growing up and you're like, man, you know, we get to, get to hang out with, with our family. We get to see our cousins. We get to see our aunts and uncles. And that was always fun to me. And then we moved up here. I lived in Orlando. I was born in Orlando. And we moved up here when I was in the fourth grade. And so then we had to drive back to Orlando, you know, and my dad would get, I mean, Christmas was, it was pretty exciting to me because it was, it was like, it was a big deal. Dad got off of work and uh, we would ride, he had one of those big Ford Broncos, you know, the old, the old timey Ford, not the old timey, but the old style Ford Bronco. And he would uh, put, put a pallet back there for us and we would sleep from, like he'd get home, get off to, after work. And then when he'd drive, you know, till two or three o'clock in the morning and we'd wake up and we'd be at our grandparents' house. And, you know, it was just always fun. There was always just this sense of excitement, this air of excitement. And uh, you miss that as a kid, you know, as an adult, you miss that. <laughs> I don't know how many of you had that, but you miss that. You miss that sense of excitement of getting to see and to be. And that's what makes having, having children and having family around uh, so special and so important. But what is the most important thing about Christmas is the love that appeared that day. That over 2,000 years ago that, G, that, that God saw and he, he planned and he knew that we would need something for us to look forward to. He knew that we would need, we would need something for us, for other people to look forward to in us. Go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And we're going to look at just some simple scriptures this morning about love and what love means at Christmas time. John chapter 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world. I'm in the New American Standard this morning. I'll be reading some out of the um, God's Word translation, which I've just started kind of reading a little bit more. But we're in the New American Standard with our scripture reading this, this year. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that who anyone or everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God so loved the world 
that he gave his only son. And, you know, people will, will walk around and go, well, how come we don't see God love, you know, God's love? Or how come, you know, we've got all these things going on in the world today? And where is God in all this? And what's God doing? And why isn't he doing anything? Well, how do you know that God loves us? How do you know that God's there? How do you know that God's existing, that he is still present because he sent his love. He sent Jesus. He sent his love in the form of Jesus because he loves the world. Everybody say the world. He loves the world so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. The one who believes in him is not judged. The one who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world. People love the darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come into the light so that his deeds will not be exposed. But the one who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds will be revealed as having been performed in God." I think that love is, is such a tricky word these days because so many people, you know, we're, we're, we're in this age of re redefinition. Everybody wants to redefine things for us. They want to tell us what truth is. They want to tell us what all these different things are that, that maybe you grew up with as a, a, a standard in your life or something that you were used to in your life, that you're comfortable in your life. And people are wanting to redefine that. They're wanting to say, no, 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 no. I feel like that this means this, or I feel like this means that. Do you know what I'm saying without me saying too much? Do you understand what I'm saying? But what God does is that he gave us, it says here that he gave us his son. He gave us his love so that we would have these deeds now that would be exposed by the light because we're doing them inside of God. See, everything that Jesus did, everything that he said, we know that he only said what he heard the Father say. We know that he only did what he saw the Father do. So that means that everything that Jesus said and everything that Jesus did was permissible and acceptable by God because he did it in him. And so as we're thinking about love this Christmas, how do we do it in him? How do we make sure that that definition of love that we have for other people is done in him and through him? Because that's how we draw people that's how people are drawn to God. That word love there is, a, is, a, is just, just simply, I'm going to give you the Greek for this. It's, the, it's, it's agapeo. It's agapeo. And it's a, it's, it is similar to uh, man's love. It is similar to um, uh, the body of Christ, the believers loving each other, okay? It is a, it is a word that means to give. It is a word that means to not condemn. Does everybody understand what that word con condemn means? It means that you're, you're judging, that you're coming against, that you're condemning an action or you're condemning an attitude. Uh, this love that God gave that day, God so loved the world, was a love that was not condemning. It was, it was a love that was not like, you know, it was a love that actually saved. It's agapeo. It's of the benevolence which God in providing salvation for man has exhibited by sending his son to them and giving him up to death. It's an inclination to perform kind and charitable acts, giving not to receive. So this is a, a, a whole, this is really a different mindset of what love is and because it's, because it's God's love. And we don't always understand God's love. We don't always understand how God, how God could love the world without even seeing what was gonna happen in the world. But he, did, he, knew, he knows the beginning from the end, so he knew exactly where we would be this day. But we don't understand that in our, in our finite minds. In our minds, we don't, we don't get that. We don't see it. But we, and we were like, how could God love this person? Or how could God love this situation? Or how could God love? But he does. And he gave his only begotten son so that he could change that, so that he could help them. The, this love here is an example of what God gives. What's to be understood is that this gift was for everyone. The gift of Jesus Christ is for everyone. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful this morning that God's gift of Jesus was for you? Say it's for me. 
It's okay to be like that. This, this, is a, this is a gift that is accepting. It's a gift of acceptance. And this is how God accepts you into his family through believing in his son. So when Jesus, Jesus is here and he's with Nicodemus in this, in this situation, and Nicodemus is somebody that studied, he knows the law, and he doesn't quite understand what Jesus is saying here. And Jesus is pointing him just to the, to, to the word of God. He's pointing him to the, the life of God. And he's pointing him to an understanding of God. That God loved the world. And he loved it so much that he gave his only begotten son. So that's what love is. That's what the kind of love is that God gives us. It's an accepting love. It's a love that brings people into the family of God. All right? Because you, because you accept Jesus, now all of a sudden you're in the family of God. Because you accept the work of Christ, you're in the family of God. So that, that love that God gave you brought you into his kingdom and his, into his place. See, and one thing that we have to remember as Christians, well, let's go to John chapter one. John chapter one. This is a, a, I love this verse, this scripture. John chapter one, verse one says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, the Word, was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of mankind, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot grasp it. What we have to understand is that people don't understand the love of God from the start. They don't understand the love of God from the beginning. What is this? Let me see that. Does anybody know? Where's Miss Judy? What in the world? I'm at to miss, ask Miss Ann. Oh, Miss Ann, come on. I thought you were on my side. No, it goes this way. It goes this way. See, this is a good example of having to walk in love. Right? Don't take my picture holding this. Uh-uh, that's, that'd be terrible. I'm gonna be praying over Miss Ann a little bit. Like, Miss Ann gave me this candle this year when Carolina was having a hard time. They were having a difficult time in their season. And, you know, they'd lost a couple of games. And, you know, Miss Ann, from, she just was thinking about me. She, she was being led by God. God was giving her actions and things that she needed to do to act in love towards me. And she gave me this little candle thing that, burnt, you know, you, turn, you flick the light on. And it helps get rid of all the, the bad vibes of what Carolina was doing. Because what they were doing just stunk, Right? <laughs> And so I, I, I turn this thing on, and lo and behold, they win. They beat, they beat Texas A&M. They haven't beaten Texas A&M ever, and they beat Texas A&M. Well, the next week, I forgot to turn it on so quick, and they lost to Florida. Okay? But then the week after that, I turned it on, and they beat Vanderbilt. And then guess what? They beat Tennessee. And then guess what? They beat Clemson. How can you do this to me? You're going to mess it all up. I'm just kidding. She said, it's not for me. We're talking about love here. She loved me. Yes, she does. I'm sorry. That just, I saw that and I was like, that is obnoxious. Oh my goodness. We were out shopping yesterday. We were out shopping yesterday in the, the I couldn't believe all the orange I saw. And I, don't, I mean, it's, they did. They won, they won the ACC. I'm so, I, if you're any of you are Clemson fans and I'm, and I'm, I don't know. And it's okay. I, I, it's all right that you're a Clemson fan because it's okay that I'm a Carolina fan. And so you, you see all this orange everywhere, and I'm like, man, that is a lot of orange. There's a lot of orange going on. Oh, we're talking about the love of God. As believers, go to Romans chapter 5. How important it is that during the Christmas season that we're walking in love. They were walking in the love that God gave to us on that day that Jesus was born, that God gave us his love. And it's a different kind of love than what the world sees. It's a different kind of love than what, how the world defines it. The world is constantly changing how it defines what love is. 
Do you know that? Do you understand that? That it's not, it's not the same that it was 20 years ago. It's not the same that it was 40 years ago. The definition of love is different. But God's love, the definition that God placed in his word and his truth has never changed. Because he's always in a place where he is ready to receive us. He's always in a place where he is ready to, to bring us to him and to bring us into the kingdom of God. But he set a parameter into motion. And this is important for believers because you believe in Jesus, you now have access to the Father. You have now have unlimited access to the Father because of the love that was given to you. And what we have to be reminded of, especially in the Christmas season, I think Jonah was telling me, that there was some, some lady sent an email to all of her family and they, she was like, we can't discuss this, we can't discuss this, we can't discuss, and like gave this whole list of things that they couldn't discuss during the holiday season. How many of you feel like that sometimes? I mean, seriously, nobody wants to talk football with me, you know, because Clemson lost to Carolina, right? But how many, how often do we feel like that because of the, we, we don't like the conflict, we don't like, we don't know how to respond, we don't know how to react, we don't know how to, to move forward with these relationships that mean so much to us. Our family means a lot to us, amen? Family means a lot to us. Well, you can do it, and I'm here to, I'm here to help you, I'm here to tell you that, that we can do it, because the love of God, listen, Romans chapter five, verse five says that hope does not disappoint. Hope does not disappoint. God gives us hope. God gave us hope in Jesus Christ. When we confess him, when we believe in him, we now have that realized hope of salvation. We now have that understanding of what we have in Christ. We know who, you know, we're learning who God is. We're learning who we are in Christ. We're learning the things he has for us. And so that hope that God has for us does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts. The love you as a believer have received the love of God, that it has been poured out in your heart. The love of God. I'm not talking about world love. I'm not talking about, you know, the love that you have. Americans, we've said this before, I know that Americans are so funny because you can say, I love my wife, I love my dog, and I love hot dogs in the same sentence and use the same word. But the Bible doesn't talk about love like that. There are different levels. There's different, different kinds of love. There's different types of love. And this love that God gave to us when he gave us Jesus is a, is a love that knows no beginning and it knows no end to God. Now to us, it does have a beginning because it, at some point you realize, wow, God loves me. God loves me. And he cares about me and his, his heart is forming and he's thinking about me and he's, he's got plans for me. He's got purposes for me. He wants to take me uh, from where I'm at into a place that's better. That's, that's what God is. That's what salvation is. He's a deliverer. He's a healer. He's a restorer. He's, he's, a, he's one that, that is a giver. He doesn't stop giving to us. Because he's got the love of God. Well, now that love is on the inside of us because it's been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So it's important to realize that and to remember that. We have what we have the world does not know about. They don't understand it because they don't know who God is. And so that is our job. That is our number one responsibility is showing truthfully who God is, showing unashamedly who God is. So some things that we have to do in order for that to take place, Romans chapter 12, verse two, tells us that we're supposed to renew our minds, that if God's love is different than the love that we maybe grew up knowing or you know, the love that we see on TV or we, the love that we hear in, in, in love songs or hate songs or whatever kind of songs you're listening to, there is, there is something different. And so you have to renew your mind to what the word of God says about love. You have to get into what God's word says about love. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter four. 2 Corinthians chapter four, down in verse nine. Uh, we'll start in verse eight. It says, we're afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not despairing. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're not struck down. We're not destroyed. We're always carrying around in the body the dying 
of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. That is what love is. And as we're walking out what love is, there's these things that we have to deal with as, as humans, as, um, as family members, as, as spouses, as parents, as children. There are these things that we have to, we have to contain, contend with. He says here, we're re- afflicted in every way, but because of Jesus, we're not crushed. There's things that come against us that are, that are constantly trying to keep us from, from exhibiting or showing off. We were talking, we've been talking on Wednesday nights in the, about in the book of James and how the book of James says that we're supposed to be doers of the word. And a doer, all he's meaning there is that you're supposed to be producing on the outside so people can see what's on the inside. It's a production. It is something that, that, that people, maybe they've never seen it before. But it comes from the script of the word of God and you're producing that script. You're making that script something that's real. I love a movie that can take a script and just makes you feel like you're right in the middle of it. That you're right there. One of the movies that that I think is a lot of fun is the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And you feel like you're right there. You're right there and the trees are are coming alive around you. That's that script that's being, that a producer has taken apart and, and, and is totally making it come alive to the viewer, to the one that's watching it. That's what we're supposed to be like. That's, that's our job. That's our duty as children of God, as producers, because in, even though we're afflicted in every way, we're not crushed. Even though we get confused by, circum, by circumstances and things that are going on, perplexed, we're not despairing. Even though people make fun of us because of our faith, we're not abandoned. We're struck down but not destroyed. We are always carrying around in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be revealed in our body or the works of Jesus would be revealed in our body. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You want to know what love is. You want to know what love is. Well, Paul was, was kind enough to pin it down for us. Paul was kind enough to say, all right, Guys, you know, the Corinthians, they were lovers. Oh, they were lovers. They were, they were in all sorts of crazy stuff. They loved each other. They, didn't, they loved their, you know, they loved things about their, um, their mother-in-law or their, you know, they, they were crazy lovers. And so Paul had to set them straight according to what the word says. Paul had to set them straight according to what God's love. And again, this love here is called agape. This love here is called agape. He says in verse 13, verse one, if I speak with the tongues of mankind and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but do not have love or agape, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions to charities, or if I surrender my body so that I may be my glory, if I surrender my body so that I may glory, but do not have love, it does me no good. Then he goes in and he says that love is patient, love is kind. It's not jealous, it does not brag, it's not arrogant, it does not act disgracefully, it does not seek its own benefit. It's not provoked. It does not keep an account of a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but it rejoices with the truth. It keeps every confidence. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. We're talking about, that's love. That's love. Patient, kind, not jealous, not braggy, not arrogant, not disgraceful, it doesn't seek its own benefit. It's not provoked. It doesn't keep track of things that have happened to it all through the past. And this, is, this, is, this is, helps us in how we handle people, how we handle relationships, how we handle those that, that we have the honor of showing off who God is. That we have to you know, kind of tweak our thinking when we come around people. And it's not because it's not um, arrogant, it's not boastful, it's not jealous, it's not rude, uh, it doesn't seek its own benefit, it's not selfish, it keeps every confidence, it believes things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, and endures all things, because all of a sudden now we have, to, we have to change that, because so much of the time we're looking at people and go, well, what have you done for me lately? 
you know, or what are you doing to, to, to help? What are you doing? And we want to always want to put it on, on somebody else. But God wants it to start with us. Isn't that cool? God wants us to start. He wants it to start with us. We're the demonstrators of the love of God. We're the, the ones that are producing the love of God in our life. And our lives should reflect that. Verse 8 says, love never fails. Everybody say that. Love never fails. That when you're walking in the God kind of love, those actions won't fail. Now listen, they may not produce fruit like you think it should, but it doesn't fail. So it's a, a thinking that goes beyond what we can imagine or we can, you know, where, where, we, can, where we end up. God's love doesn't fail. It doesn't fail for you. If you're walking in love, God's love will produce in your life. What somebody else does with it, that's between them and God. You can't do anything about that. You can't do anything about that except for walk in love. Except for walk in love. Go down to, um, let's see. Again, this word agape is affection, it's goodwill, it's benevolence. And it's especially of the love of Christians towards Christians. So he's, he's talking to the church at Corinth and he's telling them, you know, this is, this is how you should be acting towards each other. This is how you should be. This is the atmosphere that should be uh, being brought when you come together as, as children of God. It's something that's in us because of God. We're not born with this kind of love. It's something that, is, that becomes implanted to us when, when in Romans chapter five, he says, the spirit, the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of you and brings love. It's now shed abroad in your heart. You have these qualities on the inside of you now. You have patience, you have kind, you have all these things in 1 Corinthians 13. All of those things are alive in you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to make sure that you understand, even though that love, the kind of love that God has is an accepting love, it's not, it doesn't mean it's agreeing. It doesn't mean that it's, a lo- that it's something it's, that, that you agree with it. Just because you're walking in love with somebody doesn't mean that you're agreeing with what they're doing or how they are living or the actions that they're, that they're showing off, all right? Again, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. As we get to know God, we, be, we become people that are in agreement with him. But that didn't get us, it's not something that we're trying to get to anymore. We're not trying to attain this great love of God that if we do everything exactly right, then all of a sudden we're right there. No, you're right there the moment that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're in total acceptance with God. And I think as, as we're, as we're uh, coming around people that don't necessarily agree with us, and one of the three, you know, three of the main things I think that we see, aside from Clemson or Carolina, amen, you know, that's something people have a hard time agreeing on. And uh, one day, you know, we'll all come in agreement on Clemson and Carolina. But there's three things that we have a hard time with. We have uh, politics is something, um, culture, cultural things are something, uh, religion is something. The, that people, when they come together, seems to be what can pull you apart. You know, and I started talking about how when, uh, when I was little and I always looked forward to and I anticipated that time that I got to spend with my family, I wasn't worried about those things. You know, I wasn't worried about what are, what are, what's the big political discussion going to be today. Back then it was, is Carter eating uh, jelly beans? I think there was a joke about Jimmy Carter that he used to eat jelly beans or something like that. I can't remember what it is, but I was, I was so young. I wasn't even born yet when he was president. I'm just kidding. I was. But then, but then, you know, and then we had, so we had Jimmy Carter and then we had uh, Ronald Reagan and, uh, you know, and then we've gone on from there. But I wasn't worried about that. That's my point. I wasn't worried about 
who, who we were gonna discuss, you know, who the, who the governor was or, or those kind of things. I wasn't worried about, um, I wasn't worried about a religious discussion. I wasn't re- worried about a cultural discussion. I wasn't worried about, well, what are we gonna hash out today? How are we gonna figure out? You know, and, and sometimes when you get around family and you get around people, you're, you're like, you're concerned. Oh, oh, what are we gonna talk about today? But Jesus shows us how to handle acceptance, not agreement, because unless it's with the word of God, and Jesus was this way. I mean, Jesus told people, look, if you, if you can't handle this, I'm sorry. If you don't agree with what I'm saying, if you don't agree with what the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords says, I'm sorry, but I'm here for you. And that's part of what acceptance is. That's what Jesus is wanting us to do and wanting us to accomplish here. You know, First John chapter two, it, uh, the, he goes through and he, and he talks about he talks about love. John is such a has such a beautiful way of of describing what love is. And he saw love. He walked, he walked with love. He walked with Jesus Christ. In 1 John chapter 2, down in verse 12, he says, I'm writing to you, little children. Make sure I'm starting in the right place. 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you on account of his name. You've been accepted into the kingdom of God. He's writing to the church here. So he's writing to us. And he's saying, your sins have been forgiven on the account of his name, the name of Jesus. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. How do you do that? You did it through Jesus Christ. I've written to you, children, because you know the Father. I've written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you're strong and the word of God remains in you and you have overcome the evil one. Now he's saying this to the church and he's saying all these things happen because of their relationship with Christ. Because they, accept, they accepted him. They received what Christ did. And so now Christ has received them. And so now all of a sudden they're in a place of, of being an overcomer. They're in a place of, of, of being somebody that doesn't have to give in to what's going on in the world today. Or what the evil one is trying to come against. Then he goes on here because he says we need some more help. We need some more definition of what love is. He says in verse 18, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He's, talking, he's not talking about the people of the world. Because he said, for God so loved the world, the people. God so loved everybody that was going to be created. I tend to think this even means that he loved the world. That we could even go in. I mean, we, we know that the, the word world there is this, this, this age or you know, this time period. He loved the world so much. But I believe that he loved his creation so much that Jesus, the power of Christ, was so good for creation. But then he says, whoever believes in him, so that's people, and it's not limited to a race. It's not limited to a culture. It's not limited to a people group. It's not limited to a time period. He's saying you would, you would be saved and have everlasting life. So when he's talking, when John's talking here and he says don't love the world or the things in the world, he's saying don't get caught up in what the world is producing. Don't get caught up in the, in the thoughts and the ideas that the world is generating and saying, well, this is acceptable today. And then tomorrow it says, no, that's not acceptable, but this is acceptable now. And then to, the next day it says, well, that's not acceptable. This is acceptable. It's like a moving target every single day. You have to get on Twitter and go, well, what am I allowed to say if you're trying to love like the world loves? But I believe that when we're walking in God's love, you'll always have the right thing to say. You'll always be able to, 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 to be the person that's exhibiting the love of God so that people have an opportunity to receive that. Jesus did that, and he did that so exceptionally. He did it in, in a way that we need to study it and we need to understand it. Go to uh, John chapter 4. John chapter 4. I want to look at two examples this morning about how Jesus handled People that didn't know him, that, you know, this is, these are people that could have 
possibly heard about him but didn't quite know what to do with it. But they were people that, that, that were, were sinners. They were people that, that were not following God, didn't even know didn't even know how to get to God, didn't even know a direction to come to him. Uh, chapter four, verse seven, we know that Jesus, is a, he, he goes to a well, and in verse seven, he says, the woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food. So the Samaritan woman says to him, how is it that you, though you're a Jew, are asking me for a drink, though I'm a Samaritan woman, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans? Isn't that something that in the Bible, certain people didn't associate with other people? Isn't that something that, that you would have that mentality or that thought 2,000 years ago? But Jesus didn't think like that. Jesus didn't care about that. He replied to her and he said, in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Well, she said to him, sir, you've got no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. And Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water, and he's pointing it to the well, will be thirsty again. But, ever, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never be thirsty. But the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. So Jesus is, is talking to her. And, and some things that we can notice about this, that it didn't bother him that she wasn't a Jew. It didn't bother him that she was a lady. It didn't bother him that she didn't have a, a, a husband with her. It was not appropriate for, for people to talk to women, if you were a male, that there, you would talk to, you would direct your, I mean, I, this is crazy, you know, we think we're struggling with, with things nowadays, I mean, they were like, you can't talk, talk to somebody if the husband's not present, but Jesus wasn't concerned about that. He wasn't concerned about what culture said. He wasn't concerned about what the direction of, of those that were around him would think. He was concerned about giving her a chance to make a decision for eternal life. She appreciates him. She appreciates his kindness because Jews and Samaritans, they weren't friends. Samaritans thought that if you weren't a Samaritan, that you, you were just as good as dead, that you were just as good as gone. And so they, they looked at, at Jewish people the same way that Jewish people considered Samaritans. But Jesus had something to say that transcended culture, religion, and politics. And so as, as, you, as you're coming around those that you know you're not going to agree with, make sure you've got something to say that transcends, that goes, and I mean, I mean goes above political affiliation, goes above cultural affiliation, goes above uh, religious affiliation, because that's how Jesus handled talking to people that did not live like him or look like him or act like him or talk like him. He made her curious about the things of God. He made her curious about who Jesus is. He made her curious about what he could give her. That's a, 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 just a different way of thinking. Well, how do I, how do I direct my, their attention towards God? This is gonna take some thought on your part. This is gonna take some, some prayer on your thought. You're gonna have to do some, some renewing of your mind so that you're able to, when I get into a situation like this, First of all, I don't get impatient. I don't get rude. I don't get, you know, uh, puffed up. I don't get the things of, of 1 Corinthians 13, of what it says that I am, but I'm able to respond and help make them curious about the life-changing power that's on the inside of me. That's what's important this Christmas season. That's what's important every season. Amen. Jesus spoke to her. I like this. And I think this is something that we can all uh, work on. Jesus spoke to her as if she was more spiritual and understanding than she actually was, meaning that he didn't talk down to her. He didn't belittle her. He didn't, he wasn't like, well, if you only knew who I was, I mean, he didn't even say who he didn't even say who he was. He was talking about what he could give her. What can you give somebody today? What can you give somebody tomorrow? 
He did reveal himself to her. And our job is to reveal ourselves through the kind of love that God gives. So that takes, it's gonna take some, God, how do I, how do, I do this? How do I think differently about these situations that I may be going into? Because there are some people that are gonna come around here and they're, they're gonna be ready. They're gonna be ready to bash everything that you believe, everything that you say. They're gonna be like, well, Clemson's done this and Clemson's done that and Clemson's done this. You know, they're gonna be like that. And you have to be, all right, all right, all right. Let's point them a different direction. Let's go a different way here. Let's go a different way because you could, that's just what you have to do. John chapter eight. Another example here, John chapter eight. Praise the Lord. I love my Clemson people because they're my friends. Amen. They're my friends and we can have fun, right? John chapter eight, verse two. It says, in the early morning, he came into the temple area and all the people were coming to him and he sat down and began to teach him. So we know that Jesus went about doing good, teaching and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. We know that. That is what we're told in the, in the letters, that Jesus went about constantly revealing who God is. He constantly was revealing who God is through word and through action, through deed. And there was never any confusion, never any confusion. They, were, they never, they never uh, were against each other. They never were against who God was. Verse 3 says that the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in the act of adultery. And after placing her in the center of the courtyard, they said to him, teacher, this woman's been caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now, what's interesting here, how many of you know that if you're caught in the act of adultery, that there would be two parties being adulterers? Well, why did they only bring one? This is the Pharisees are the, they're the law people. I mean, they're like, you know, bam, bam, bam. This is the law. This is the law. This is the law. But why were they only bringing about the one? People that are looking for a fight never fight fairly. It says here in the law, they were telling Jesus who knows the law, but they were telling him now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman what then do you say? Now they were saying this to test him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. So it's a trap. They're trying to set up, you know, they're setting up something to see, well, is he going to say, well, it's okay, you know, that she's doing this or, or is she going to, is, is she going to, is he going to make an example of her? You know, they're trying to see, well, what, which way is Jesus going to go here? Again, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Believing in him would not perish and have everlasting life. Now they were saying this in verse six to test him so they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. And when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, who is, this, who is without sin among you? Let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And then again, he stoops down. And he wrote on the ground. And now when they heard this, they began leaving one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone with the woman where she was in the center of the courtyard. And straightening up, Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, do not sin any longer. See, Jesus, we see here, Go if you keep going in verse 12, he talks and he says here, well, let's read it. Then Jesus spoke to them again saying, because it's in the same, same time period, they're in the same place, they've not moved on. And he's talking to the people, those that are around that he was teaching. And he says, I'm the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in, dar will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so the Pharisees, they go on and they're, they're trying to mess with him again. But he's, he's just, he's constant and how and who he's delivering his message to. It didn't change. It didn't vary from, from person to person, didn't vary from situation to situation. See, even though that they, the Pharisees, were trying to trap him, the Pharisees weren't wrong, okay? They weren't wrong in the Old Testament. If you're caught in the act of adultery, you're supposed to be stoned. That is the Old Testament. That's the Old Covenant. But we know, that, we know now that Jesus came to bring life 
and to bring it more abundantly, that whoever believes on him would not, ha- would not perish, but have everlasting life. Notice here that Jesus does not react with anger. Jesus didn't get mad at the Pharisees. She's in sin. They're not wrong in how she's, they're, they're right in what she's saying. But Jesus, who came to give life, doesn't react with anger. In fact, he acts with humility by stooping down. He put himself in a position of being low and being humble. He wasn't somebody that was like, well, you don't know who I am. He was pointing them to a better way, to a better reaction, to a better life. When dealing with those Um, Let's see, when dealing with those who are openly living in sin, we must recognize the value of being forgiven and that it's for everyone. That if you don't agree with how somebody lives, we we were having a good discussion Wednesday night and, um, you know, there is a, there's, as as a parent, you want the best for your children, Right? You want, you want to help them in every single way that you can. You want, you want to even make decisions for them sometimes because you've been there and you know and you know where, what, what direction a, a decision is going to take them and, and go. But you have to trust. I heard a gentleman say that you have to trust, first of all, what you've done as a parent in their life. And then you have to trust how the word of God is working in their life, and that God has a greater ability to get them to where they need to be, where they're supposed to be, than you ever could. That's who, that's how Jesus was. Jesus wasn't going around and enforcing the rules of the law. Jesus was going around and saying, the truth will make you free from the bondage that the law gives you. It's not about how well can I line up with what the law says, but it's how well can I line up with what the word says, what Jesus is saying to bring life and to bring it more abundantly. Jesus, in in dealing with this person, and we all know people, we all understand that there's people that go through times in their life where they make a decision and it doesn't line up with The word, it doesn't line up with what God's saying is best for them. They even know, they know God and they've experienced his goodness, but yet they get get caught up in decisions that they've made and they start going down this path that's leading them away. Well, how do you get around them? How do you you show them the love of God? How do you show them? You show them what forgiveness looks like. That's what Jesus was doing with the the lady here. She She was caught in sin, There's no denying it. But Jesus didn't say, it's okay, just don't get caught again. He said, go and sin no more. Because that's what we need the forgiveness from. That's what the forgiveness is there for. That's what Jesus came to bring us, to bring us forgiveness, to bring us back into a relationship with God. Jesus worked, he worked to bring down a tent situation. This wasn't, uh, you know, just people walking by and they're like, hey, yo, Jesus, Uh, This lady right here, no, they were mad. They were caused a stir. They were ready. How many of you ever been stung by a a nest of of yellow jackets? That's a lot like how this was. This was very tense. But Jesus, in his wisdom, Jesus, in in his humility, was able to bring down a very tense situation to point everybody in the direction of what forgiveness brings of what forgiveness gives to us. That's showing love. He gives the example here of what happens of, uh, when we're with Christ. That because she, she had the opportunity to choose and go Jesus's direction by not sinning anymore, all of a sudden she didn't, wasn't to be condemned anymore. She wasn't living in a, in a place of condemnation. Romans 8, 1 tells us there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus gave her hope, He didn't agree with her behavior, but he accepted her and told her what to do with it. He accepted her to help her and to to, to help her go a different direction. Again, Jesus does not come to condemn, but he comes to save, as in John chapter 3, 17 and 18. How important it is to remember that we have the ability and the job to introduce people to the Savior. How important it is to remember that this Christmas season, our job is not 
to fix people and correct people and try and get people to think and act like we do. Okay, you all should be going, oh, good. <laughs> Whoo, because I was getting concerned. No, our job is to point people in the direction of Christ Amen. and give them a reason to want to get to know them. Because if you're not doing that, you're failing. You're failing them and you're failing yourself. But we don't have to fail. We don't have to fail. We don't have to be ones that are, that are nobody wants to be around me at Christmas. Everybody wants to be around me at Christmas. Jesus, everybody wanted to be around Jesus. But that means that Jesus was being successful in how he was living and how he was delivering a promise, the promise of forgiveness and the promise of hope. Amen. Y'all stand with me. Let's just pray for a moment. Father, we worship you. We praise you. We honor you. We exalt you. We magnify you. Father God, we make you so big in our lives. Father God, we make you so big in our lives that, Father, no matter what situation we're presented with, Lord, we know that because you're with us and because we're with you, because we're in you, that, Father God, there is nothing we can't handle. There's nothing that we can't, can't, can't go through, Father God, without, without knowing that we're going to come out on the other side. We're going to come out on the other side. And we're not going to have lost our, our love. We're not going to have lost our, 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 our hope. We're not going to have lost our, our life that we get to enjoy because of you. Father, we ask you this Christmas season to not just remind us of the, of the beautiful child that, that came to us that day. To not just remind us of the, of the gifts that were brought to that child that day. To not, remind us, not just remind us of how the angels celebrated his birth that day. But Father God, to remind us of the love that became flesh that day. And that he's the perfect example of how we're to live and how we're to be. And Lord, as we're around people that, that, that we maybe don't agree with, maybe we don't, don't understand where they're coming from, we don't understand the, the lifestyle that, that maybe they've chosen or that they've even been around. But Father God, we do understand what you've done for us, that you've forgiven us because you love us, that you saved us because you loved us, that you redeemed us because you love us, that you, you translated us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of the son of your love because you love us, that you heal us because you love us, that Father God, that you meet our every need according to your riches and glory because you love us. Father, you tell us that, that it's not because we first loved you, but because you loved us. And so we're to take that love, that love that knows no bounds, that love that knows no beginning and ending. It's not weighted on circumstances. It's not weighted on where we're from or who our parents are or what kind of job we have. It's not weighted on what our kids are like or what our parents are like. It's not weighted on what kind of car I drive. That love that's on the inside of us is for everyone. It's for everyone. And so, Father, as we're going about this Christmas season, that, Lord, that we're exercising. We're exercising 1 Corinthians 13. Oh, we're, we're walking in it, Lord. We're walking in it, Lord. We're walking in it, Lord. That you've empowered us by the Holy Spirit to walk in it each and every moment of each and every day. I thank you, Father God, for it. Lord, our, our desire, and I believe I'm speaking this for everyone, that our desire is not for me to be right, but for the truth, the truth of God to be revealed. That's what we want revealed this Christmas season. Love came down.